A system I can get to it without uh, trying to remember where it is. <laughs> <laughs> I had a word this morning too, but like it was a part of the interpretation to the end last song, um, which uh, that other word was too, but the Lord just says, and he's going to be saying a lot of this, he said, tell them to be quiet. <laughs> and stop talking. And I had that really strong sitting down there, but I want to tell you, um, I have to tell you this little story first, but um, I, you know I take groups to Ireland and Scotland, and so Pastor Powell came with me. Where did we go? Wales. Oh, we went to Wales in England. Okay. Well, um, one of the times, a couple of years ago, I was with my group, and we were actually in England. You're welcome to come, by the way. Um, we were in a, with a group in England, and we were in um, a place, I was doing a conference, and it's called um, Mook. I can never remember. Mookahanga. Mookahanga Estate. Mookahanga Estate. Mokahanga, M O G G, Mokahanga Estate. And, um, I mean, I've done several conferences there. It's a huge estate, it's beautiful in the country near Bedford. And it's owned by Christians for centuries. And so I did a conference there, it was really lovely. I did like a Friday night. And when the meeting finished, I was talking to some people over here. And I saw like a flash of light, which you've all seen a flash of light. And so I said to one of the ladies in my group, go over to that side of the room and check out what that is because I was still talking to these people. So I, ended, I finished up talking to them and I went over to Carol to see where Carol was and she was like in a trance. She just wasn't there, she was just in a trance. And there was a, you were there, weren't you? Yeah, and there was a little crowd around her and um, I think we had to leave, so we picked her up and carried her to the bus. And then we carried her into the hotel, into the foyer, and we sat there while she came out of this like trance. So when she came out of it, we said, um, well, we know what happened. But she couldn't really explain everything, except that she said she got caught up with an angel from William Wilberforce Ministry. <coughs> in the last century, century and a half ago. And so, um, and she did write all that down afterwards, it's not really relevant by now, but he, he, the angel showed her a lot of things, and then the, I think it was the next day, we found out that at Margahanna, that's where William Wilberforce used to go to rest. Oh. You know, he's given those names, he tried 19 times to get that, uh, slavery thing through Parliament. Spent his life getting that bill pushed through and the last time he did was 19 times. And um, so, but that's where, and everybody fought him. I mean, if you think people have tightened Donald Trump, it was nothing on what they fought him. Um, but he, um, he rest there. So his angel was still there at Margaret Hammings and he caught up Carol. Well, there were some things you know, that I wished I could ask Carol that she could have asked that angel. <laughs> you see, but um, a few months later, probably no, maybe six months later, that same angel came to my house. Wow. And I, I asked him a couple of questions I wanted to ask him. One of which was, um, Will, William Wilberforce was sick all his life, was, was very sick. So I said to that angel, I want to know why uh, William Wilberforce, who's such a like a mighty man of God, and you know, got that uh, slavery thing through the Parliament, and I want to know why he was so sick all the time. And he said, it's very simple, he didn't believe that way. He didn't believe that way, because a lot of them, they didn't really believe in healing. You know, it's the old... Calvinism stuff and everything. They believed was God um, wrongly, I believe, uh, 
trying to, trying to teach you something. You know, he's giving you cancer because he's trying to teach yourself, teach you something. Which is, which is, I told you it's scriptural to me, because Jesus died for those things. Amen. He died for our sins, he died for our sicknesses. Yeah. Amen. So that we could receive healing. But they didn't kind of believe like that. And so he was sick. I don't, it was a shame that he was sick. But anyway, the other interesting thing was that, um, but the angel did say to me, but he did fulfill his calling to the day. Wow. And he, his bill was put through Parliament and the day they got together to start to iron out, iron out how to implement it is the day he died. So he saw the whole thing for back and you know, many enemies got it for and it passed. But God didn't take him then when it passed, he passed the day they started to iron it out. And that's the day he died, so he actually did fulfill his calling to the day. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. But that angel left, and um, I just sense something's coming into the body of Christ, coming to the church. Um, the angel left, so I started ch like chattering. You ever like chatted to the Lord? You kind of like chattering away, I was chattering away. And the Lord suddenly said to me, be quiet. I'm like, oh. <laughs> he said, be quiet. You talk too much. The same things I've got this morning, you talk too much. And so, and I was thinking this morning that like, you know, it wasn't that long ago, I mean a century or so ago, people fasted from talking. You know, we fast from food and stuff. But they actually did have, they fasted from talking. It was not... Um, uh, and that was fairly normal that Christians did that. And you know, 200 years ago, it was even more was part of what you did. You fasted from food, you fasted from talking. In fact, it would be really hard for some of us. But um, there is something about talking too much, you know. And I think that um, I wrote a couple of things down when the Lord showed me. Because I mean, when I got here this morning, I still didn't have anything in the night. I was asking them, what do you want me to say? No, you didn't give me anything. Um, I got up this morning, what do you want me to talk about? Like, nothing. I get here and still nothing. So I sat down there and they were saying, uh, talk to me about some things, including about the things he's going to do. And, um, I'll tell you this other story of my friend who has got the water. So I took a measle mix, mix, makes your foot dry. Mm -hmm. But thank you, don't pray over it, okay? <laughs> it comes drunk water. <laughs> um, I have a friend. Now, this was during the time of, you know, the big one, you have brand revivals down in Lakeland. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were so amazing, weren't they? Like 10,000 people a night were down there. I think every ministry got touched when they went to those meetings because it was time then. You know, people needed a fresh touch, remember? We were kind of a bit stale with the old charismatic stuff. So I had a friend, um, and he was a Pentecostal preacher. <coughs> now, this guy was an excellent preacher. I mean, excellent speaker, really good had good revelation, he was a good speaker, he got it together, you know, bring great sermons and everything. So, um, God kind of played a trick on him. Has God ever played a trick on you? Mm -hmm. Did he ever kind of trick you to something? Mm -hmm. He just did that, by the way. But anyway, what happened to Jesse, his name was Jesse, he lived near Atlanta, and he, he got kind of dry, his church. He got kind of a bit dry and bit religious, I guess. So the people in the church said to Pastor Jesse, we're going to pay you as long as you need, but you need to go away and get something from God. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we just pay your salary, just please. <laughs> and so they thought, okay, well, that, you know, we're just going on a little vacation and maybe God will tell us something, something or... <laughs> Maybe it's a different direction. Anyway, so what happened is they took off and they um, went to Florida. 
that's the, you know, if you're in Atlanta, that's what you do for a few days, you go to Florida. And so they went out to Florida, he suddenly remembered, he has a good friend that lives near, actually near Lakeland, he wasn't aiming for Lakeland, but he remembered his friend, thought, oh, I'll call, and so he called, and they said, oh yeah, come over and stay a few days with us, you know, that can be a little rest for you. So they went over to this guy, house. he's also a pastor, and um, they had some fellowship for a few hours, and his wife made a little supper. So then the, the other pastor says, well, we're actually going to a meeting, you see, and we, we'd, um, you can stay if you like, but we'd be happy, you know, if you wanted to come with us. It's this man called Rodney Howard Brown. Well, Jesse never heard of that, and he was very offended anyway, because he hasn't seen his friend for 10 years. He's driven all the way from Atlanta, so this guy says, now he's going out. You know, that's like rude. To him, that's like rude. So he was a bit put out, you know. But he didn't want to stay in the house, but he was right by themselves. So they said, okay, well, we'll come. So, because they ended up at Rodney Howard Brown. And my friend Jesse was absolutely horrified. Completely. He said, my hair was standing on end in terror because he didn't know what was happening. All these people were screaming with laughter, falling on the floor, they were like chaotic. And he was like, so, like, who's supposed to be in charge of this place? You know, what's going on? And he was very angry. But um, there's not a lot he could do. He didn't know really where he was. Um, so he just had to sit there through it all, getting madder and madder, really mad and madder. And then he thought, good, it's ended, we can get out of here. Well, suddenly Rodney invited all the pastors to come forward. He's going to pray for them all, you see. So Chris, the friend, gets up and marches forward. And then Jesse's really now horrified because now he's got to sit there another half an hour and wait for his friend. You see, he's not going out there. But anyway, so they've got all the pastors. You know how they do They just pray for everybody and everybody would fall over and the anointing would come really strong and all kinds of things would happen. Anyway, so he's really livid. And eventually his friend gets off the floor about an hour later. Yeah. And, you know, he's beside himself now. Because he thinks it's all terrible and ridiculous. So his fr- he, he's so bad that he says, look, we're going to sit in the car and wait for you. You can come when you, you know, and you won't. So, but he's too angry to move. Anyway, so eventually he thought, well, I've got to go to the car. And so Jesse, his wife went on with them, but he walked, I don't know if you went to Lakeland, there was a big green grassy area. Do you remember both the church was here, and there was like this big grassy area, and then the parking lots. So Jesse's walking back past the park, through the parking lot, through the grass, and suddenly the spirit fell on him, bang! And he fell flat on the floor. You see, and he's laid on his back now, but he can't move, so he couldn't move a finger, that scared him. He couldn't move, he couldn't speak, he couldn't, do, he just stayed there. And he stayed there for a while, and who comes walking past but Rodney Howard Brown? So Rodney Howard looks down at him, it's about, you know, two o'clock in the morning, now, and points to him, doesn't know who he is, and starts actually, Rodney's guy said, Rodney started speaking in tongues. But Jesse heard it in English. And the Lord said to Jesse, you've preached for me long enough. I think I'll speak for myself. And you be quiet. Now, he was not able to speak for six weeks. 40 days. That's the truth. He was not able to speak for 40 days. He would like, no sound would come out, he was able to speak. He said it's really good for him which was pride because he said he learned that when you can't speak, people also assume you're deaf. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, like, went to Kmart or something, like, he said, pointing at something, you know, like, or like writing down and then saying, do you mean you want the oil? <laughs> 
But anyway, so he couldn't speak for six months. He went back to his church, to the church in Atlanta. You know, they're saying, what happened? We couldn't tell them anything because he couldn't speak. He wrote little notes. They started having services. He couldn't speak. He just would walk around because he didn't know what anything else to do when the Holy Spirit started falling in the church. They had this awesome revival. It went on for months and months and months. And he said God did more by him not speaking <laughs> than all those years of work being this wonderful preacher. I mean, after six weeks, he got his voice back, and I think he just learned more to flow with the Holy Spirit, you know, and be quiet when God told him and not really had to do something. But, um, you see, the Lord's been telling me, he actually gave me a word, I don't know whether to say it, he gave me a word and then he said, I can't tell people I will not be attending their meetings. I'm like, what's that supposed to mean? So he said, no, I'm not going to be attending meetings because I'm going to take over. Amen. Now, if you don't let him take over, he's not coming, that's it. Because he's not going to be attending our meetings. Amen. Watch us do our thing. Amen. But he wants to move over this country. Yes, yes. How's that going to happen? It's going to happen when we yield to him yes. and let him do his thing. Yes. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Let's let him do his thing. So that means some of us got to learn to shut up a little bit. <laughs> we have too much to say. You know. And yeah, I, I really enjoyed the worship this morning. I'd be glad that you sang that Patrick song. Huh? What was the date today? When's St. Patrick's Day? Uh, it's Friday. Uh, Friday. Because now I have the whole of the prayer in here. St. <laughs> Patrick's prayer. Yes, in this book, the whole thing. And you know what I like about the 5th, 6th century saints of God? Patrick, by the way, was known as the man that raises dead people. That was his <laughs> reputation. He won double into the Lord by raising the king's two children from the dead. Wow. He um, had rejected the gospel um, because he had his druid wizards and they were pretty powerful. They could do stuff. But in one week, two of his children died. His little girl died of a sickness. His little boy was drowned in the river Liffey. So they were fixing to have a druid funeral. And somebody said to the king, did you know that Patrick the man that raises dead people is in the next village. How would you like that reputation? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the king said, well, bring him over, see if he can do anything. So Patrick came over, they took him to where the bodies were laid out. And the king said, can you do anything? He said, yes, I can. But if I do, it be in the name of Jesus. Amen. And if my God does this for you, you have to serve my God. <laughs> so the king said, okay, or whatever the six century equivalent of okay was. And anyway, so the children were raised that afternoon. They, he baptised the whole of Dublin in the River Liffey. Wow. So there's lots of adventures like that in my Celtic books. Uh, Bridget, Patrick, Congal, Brendan, all those. And they all raised the dead here of the sick. They had wonderful ministry. They covered Ireland and much of Europe because they went into Europe with signs of wonders. So we have to reach people with signs of wonders, is that right? They try to hear about it, they want to see something. So um, I'll just tell you the things that Lord told me when I was sitting there. Um, I can't read what I wrote. <laughs> Um, I was saying in Christ because I can't get rid of this. Everybody's expecting God to move, is that right? Yeah. Because there's been huge changes already in the atmosphere, yeah. hasn't there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And things are changing in your life, is that true? Mm-hmm. Things are changing. You can feel your attitudes are changing. These things are changing, God's stirring you up. <coughs> so, what he's looking for us to do is to really start to believe. Mm-hmm. We need to start believing because everything that God does and manifests himself is actually through our faith. 
that's he ordained, that's how he ordained that we receive. You know, we don't have to take tests, we don't have to qualify to be used by God. Jesus qualified us 100%, or else what's the point? If he qualified you 99%, the 1% cancels out the rest. <laughs> is that right? Because grace is grace is grace. Grace is 100%, but it's not grace anymore. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can add, there's nothing you can take away. So what you do. And that's how we do something. Oh, this thing I just want to read too. If somebody got Galatians 3 and bigger print than this, God, I see, it's so small this print, that's the trouble. I want to tell you what it says in the Message Bible, okay? It says this, this is Galatians 3, it's a small print. You crazy Galatians, <laughs> did someone put a hex on you? You, you crazy Houston, what do you call it? Houston. Houstonians. <laughs> you crazy Houstonians. Did someone put a hex on you? Have you taken leave of your senses? Something crazy has happened. It's obvious you don't have to crucify Jesus in clear focus. His sacrifice on the cross was just not certainly not set before you clearly enough let me put this question to you how did your new life begin was it by working your heads off to please god was it or was it by responding to god's message are you going to continue this craziness only crazy people would think they could complete by their own efforts what was begun by god you see so if it was 100% grace to bring you in, it's 100% grace to keep you in. Amen. There's 100% grace to present you for this. Yes, yes. You know, and Judy says, he is able to keep you from falling and to present you for this before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. See, you're his... Um, um, what would you call it? You're his prize. He's going to present you, he's going to say, You're his trophy, actually. Because all this time it's been him working in you. It's him that works in you, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. Is that right? It's not you working for him. He right. doesn't want you to work for him. If you work for him, quit, say I quit. <laughs> he wants you to yield to him so that he can work through you. I promise you a lot more will happen. A lot less time with a lot less effort. So you're his trophy, he's going to say, Look, Dad, what I got. And he's going to present you for this. For the presence of his glory. And guess what? He's going to get all the glory. Amen. Amen. Say this after me. God's going to get all the glory. Yeah. God's, God's going to get all the glory. See, you know the work. See, you know the work. See, you know the work. If you do some of the work, you're entitled to some of the glory, but you don't get the neighbors. Actually, we partake of his glory, the church does. But don't keep seeing the glory, so the glory already said the glory. The glory's already been sent to the church, but it gets covered up. Yes. It gets covered up with stuff. Yes. Religious stuff and yucky stuff. Actually, if you've ever been in a really strong revival, which I've been in several, the first thing that happens when God comes really strong is there's deliverance. Because the dark things start running away. Actually, have you ever noticed when someone gets delivered? Gets a lot of deliverance? I notice them, I like to watch those. <coughs> because they're like this, you they start to get delivered and they're like, get a little bit shiny. Mm -hmm. Remember the latest this? Or oh, in the church when God is doing. And then there's usually some more deliverance and God sets people free from their generational stuff and this and that and religious stuff and stuff that's happened to you maybe. 
and it starts to leave. And when it leaves, you start to see the glory. Because all that stuff just kind of covered it up. You begin to see the glory. Because uh, like in Scotland, I guess people who've got Scottish attitude, the Scottish call people shiny Christians. Oh. They call them shiny. He's a shiny Christian, she's a shiny Christian. And it means you can see the glory. And you can see the glory. When deliverance comes, is that right? And people get lighter, fuller, happier, and their faces should change. You should see the glory on people's faces. Um, so if Jesus has done all that, when God starts to move, he, he wants to take over more and more. Now I'm talking about personally, and I'm also talking about corporately, and I'm talking about the whole body of Christ as a whole. We have to start yielding and let God do it instead of trying to do it for him. I mean, we take on ourselves so much false responsibility, you know, we end up trying to be the Holy Spirit. Um, especially hard, like, actually, in great revivals, the main thing that has knocked out great, great revivals is false responsibility. And, um, for example, in the Great Welsh Revival, which you probably all heard of the Welsh Revival, 1904, um, God used a young man by the name of Evan Roberts. He was only 24 years old. He really didn't know anything much. Um, he couldn't survive college, but he went back to his church in, uh, in uh, Wales. And the anointing was on him because if his spirit came on him and he would cry and pray out to God every night. You don't just decide to do that, by the way. It doesn't work like that. But God begins to come on you. You see him move him and pray and he'd see heaven and God show him what he wanted to do. So anyway, he started to minister and preach Evan Roberts. And the place would get filled with the glory of God. People were getting... Wales was actually, after a while, covered in the glory of God. All the bars closed, everything closed, except the churches, and the shops would be open for, even the post office is closed, because they ran out of money orders where people were paying their bills, paying what they owed, and so, um, it was just full of, all the churches were packed, packed, packed every night, and everything just closed, and the glory of God covered the people. Evan Roberts really didn't know what he was doing, which is probably why it happened. Because he would just let God do whatever he wanted to do. Sometimes he'd be laying behind the pulpit all evening. Sometimes he'd be laughing, he'd occasionally, if the only time he would interfere is if he sat someone down if that was the wrong spirit. <coughs> but apart from that, he'd just let God do whatever he wanted to do. People got saved, repented, I mean, all kinds of things happened without him actually saying anything. He, he rarely preached. He just believed and enabled God to come. Now, uh, after about 10 months, actually, Evan uh, Roberts didn't really, I guess, understand, but he began to make himself responsible for how the people responded. You know, if the Holy Spirit moved, you can't really tell how people are going to respond. Because I've been in places where there were all these spiritual people, and the Holy Spirit started to move, and they <laughs> turned into that. Have you ever seen that? And some people that seem goofy and not really interested in running after God suddenly sit up. Because they start to see something they've been kind of waiting for. And so, and it can be a fun thing, but suddenly lots of nice people become like, because the religious spirits all rise up. You see, you can't tell that, you can't tell what's going to happen when God really, really, really takes over. You cannot tell what people are going to do, because what's really there comes to the surface. Amen. But anyway, so gradually, if people didn't respond how he thought he'd close the meeting, or he'd walk out, or he'd scold everybody. You see, so gradually, 
He put himself in the place of the Holy Spirit. But he wasn't the Holy Spirit. And Pastor Carolyn or any other pastor or, or like me, I stand up here, I can offer you, Carolyn can ask you, offer you what God gives me. I can only offer you what, God's give, what God gives me. I can't make you receive it. Amen. I'm not about to try. Amen. I don't want to leave here with a headache. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my job to make you receive it. To make you receive anything, that's not my job. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. If God gives you something, that's between you and Him. You have to receive it. Um, but I can't take that responsibility on myself because it will crush me. Because I'm not God. Amen. Hey, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm so happy that you're not God. Okay, turn back and say, I'm so happy that I'm not God either. <laughs> As soon as you do, do that, this heaviness will come on you. And it, it can actually affect you physically. Oh, it can. It can affect you physically. You get under force responsibility. You see, your um, responsibility is to do what he tells you to do. Is that right? Yeah. Go where he tells you to go, say what he tells you to say. And you have to be open because sometimes, guess what? Sometimes you get it wrong. <laughs> if one, any one of us in here had everything right 100% of the time, there'd be lines out here today. Probably <laughs> three miles long. So, you know, we need each other. We need somebody, sometimes to say, someone to say, hey, are you sure about that? Because you can... Uh, you know, you can get something from God, we're all wondering, aren't we, what are we supposed to do next, what's next? And God begins to show you, but you might say you get a word. Like if I say to you this morning, you know what, I feel, oh, Pastor Karen, I feel like God told me to go live in China. You see, she might think, really? <laughs> or one of you might think, you sure? You might feel something, you know. And I don't ask a hundred people what they think. No, I'm not to do that as asking for total mass confusion. <laughs> but I wait and I keep my faith out there. And somebody might come to me, maybe Pastor Cohen, maybe they go out there. So, you know, are you sure about that? Because when you said that, I felt like. And I say, thank you for sharing that. I will check it out. I'll check it out. Nothing wrong in checking it out. And I go back to God and I say, you know, you know, I feel like I was supposed to go to China, but this guy, you know, he's not sure about it. And I ask God for a confirmation, and I'm <coughs> believing for the confirmation. I'm also open, because guess what? I do not want to live in China, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but um, God might give me a confirmation. And I would like to say, thank you for sharing that. Maybe the check is really good. But I feel like God gave me a confirmation, so... I'm going to go ahead and go, would you keep praying for me? That's what that means to be open. To be open. God might like, say to me, he's right, I never told you to go to China. I say, thank you for sharing that. It's only a long trip. <laughs> anyway, so you know what I mean. We're not an island. Each one of us is not an island, we're part of the body of Christ. But we all have to do what God tells you to do in the end. You know. No one should, no one... He's your lifeline. Jesus is your lifeline. You cannot let anyone get interfere with your lifeline. Amen. You must be open as we get in trouble. Uh, we're having a... Um, um, what was the big thing years ago? All the women were so afraid of not being submissive. You know what I mean? They'd be scared of being called rebellious. So any woman that had any gulf or life had to be careful because that people said she was rebellious. Rebellion, um, having, having a spirit of, um, sub, having a submissive spirit 
means that you're open. That's what it means. It means you're open. It doesn't mean you do everything people tell you to do. Hey, hey, because yeah. in the end, you can answer to him. He's going to say to you, what did you do with the anointing I put on your life? Right. You're not going to ask somebody else. To ask you. And if you're a husband and wife, guess what, guys? Your wife has her own anointing. Amen. See, a husband and wife, the husband has an anointing, the wife has an anointing. Mm -hmm. You have a, also have an anointing you can flow together. Mm -hmm. If you're a family, there's an anointing for the family, but each child has their own anointing too. Mm -hmm. And you have to let people to be free. Look, guys. Encourage your wife to be all she can be. And I Amen. you'll be happy. Amen. And wife, Amen. encourage your husband to be all he can be. That's it. And encourage him to do what God's telling him to do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes God might tell him to do some things that like doesn't include you. Mm -hmm. You get to go shopping. When I went to see you you know. Um, God kind of tricked me. I might have talk, probably told you this before, but um, my pastor friend from Singapore, I was in my house, he texted me, and he said, we want you to come and help train some leaders. I said, I'll be there. So I left Singapore. It's like, shock everything. <laughs> Singapore. All you can see is shops, isn't it? Moms and much. I said I'll be there because I love Singapore. They love me. <coughs> so I, I'll be there. So ten minutes later, he texted me back and said, "Oh, I'm not in Singapore. I'm in Siberia." <laughs> <laughs> He's not serious because he knows me. He knows I'm not going to respond to Siberia. <laughs> and what's there exactly? But I had said it. You see. So it's like, um, will David come with you? I said, no, <laughs> David's not coming with me. Because David doesn't feel he has to protect me. He thinks I can protect myself with the Holy Ghost. Amen. So he said, do you have a friend that would come? And so I said, yeah, I have a friend with you. And so the whole story at the end was, um, Deanne came with me, paid all our fares, and he ended up in Siberia and had an absolute incredible uh, visitation. But I was kind of, like when I saw David, you would have come to Siberia, he said, No, you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, we had tremendous revivals in Siberia. And when we got to the, uh, we, the plane touched down, you know, in Siberia, um, I was like, So, I didn't know what we were going to do, where are we going to stay? Is there a Hilton here? Is there what is there? You know, what, are we going to stay in huts or what? So when the plane touched down and the plane drew up, you know, to the you would they ring the little bell and you can stand up. And um I stood up. This angel got on the plane. So I think an angel got on the plane. He came to the back where me and Diana were started pushing us around like this. Lighten up. Lighten up. Because it was heavy. So we were falling all around the place. We said, well, with the flight, the, the flight attendant came, the Siberian flight attendant said, I see a light over you. Like, oh, really? So we're looking out the window. He said, it's from the church in the sky. He <laughs> <laughs> said, look at the church up there in the sky. And the light's on you. Come from that church in the sky. So then he started getting drunk. You see, because the angels right there, well, we couldn't walk, we were like, yes, you know. The Singapore pastor said, shh. Well, if you get drunk in the spirit, people start saying, shh. It actually makes it a whole lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so we get out, he said, the pastor said, we go into the security, and they're very serious. <clears throat> so we get out into the security where they were like this. They didn't like Americans. But the angels still pushing us around. So I said, no, you are. So we were falling all around the place. You see? Screaming with laughter. Of course, you disanointed, we need to fell on the whole security. The security people started laughing and getting drunk. 
This guy was trying to stop my passport and he's falling off the chair. His head off. And he's saying, why? And we're like, Jesus? Because we couldn't speak Siberian, we couldn't speak English, they could say passport, how long is it? You know, he's falling off the chair. Where do you end up? That guy's falling off the chair. He's not going to the floor. Squidge is screaming with laughter, drunk as anything. So the whole drunk thing came back into the security. All the security was laughing and calling him. The people were saying, What should we do with our cases? I like, just take them. They just took their cases. You see, well, then the, um, I guess the manager or something came running out because he heard all the commotion. And the people on the floor, and the people screaming with laughter. And he said, What is what is this? You know, he put his hand on my back and I fell over. <laughs> then after a little while they're doing this. So I said to this English guy, do you know what they're saying? He said, yes, they can taste honey. Oh. They can taste honey. And God told me, yes, when someone can tell them about Jesus, I'll bring that same taste back and they'll know it's something good. You see, so when you enjoy the Lord and you start just shielding to the Holy Spirit, even if it seems to be the opposite. I mean, when you see people that are like this, you don't think to laugh, do you? <laughs> you think to, like, be meek as possible. You know, be quiet as an ass. The Holy Spirit did the opposite. So he said that laughter would have broke the whole thing off that whole place. And he started getting a manifestation of the presence of the Lord that really just came out of our drunkenness. So it's better to be drunk than try and work for Jesus. Try and work for Jesus. Yeah. He doesn't want you to work for him. He loves you to pieces. He wants you to yield to him, not to work for him. He's not looking for workers. He's looking for his sons and daughters to rise up. Yeah. Yeah. The people he called them to be. But guess what your first calling is? Your first calling is to enjoy God. Yeah. Yeah. Don't serve him if you don't enjoy him, because you'll just be passing on your religion. No one's interested. <laughs> well, you see, he wants us to be like, do this. I so tell put your antenna up. All he's looking for you is to be in tune and to be willing. And forget the self-consciousness and all that stuff. Because God sometimes tells you to do things out there which make no sense. Mm -hmm. You know, or say something that like your mind is thinking, mm -hmm. I can't say that. Or, you, or he tells you to pray for somebody who looks very unfriendly. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of happen to you? Mm -hmm. There's somebody in the line and they're like in a bad mood <laughs> and very unfriendly. And God tells you to pray for them. And like, oh, you fight me. <laughs> you see, so he's looking for people just to do that because he's going to come and he's not going to attend our other stuff. He wants to take over. Mm -hmm. He wants to take over everything. That's how America will be affected by the revival, is when you allow the presence of God to manifest. And sometimes that is, he uses you. So you don't care what people think about you. Who does care what people think about them? Be honest. Let's break that. Because you know what? What's your name? Kirk. Kirk. The old Kirk was crucified. Right? The old man was crucified. Not going to be trying to be. Jesus already did that. So by faith, we can walk in the new man who's created in righteousness and holiness. You see, so next time you're tempted to feel self-conscious, you will, oh, Kirk has been crucified. So what does it matter? If you're dead, what does it matter what people think about you? It doesn't matter, does it? Mm -hmm. If you can get free, you see, you can, you can do what he tells you to do. Let me just pray against that thing. I pray against fear of people. I pray against fear of people's response. I pray against people's Faces! You could look at them. I it's negative things that come at you from people sometimes. And I think that I pray this morning for a split of abandonment. 
to the purposes of birth. You know, in Ireland, this century, they have what I call the Peregrini. The Peregrini left the monasteries and they would get into their little boats. And the boat had no rudder and it had no oars. They got in the boat and trusted God to send the winds to take them where they were supposed to go. I'd say that was a spirit of abandonment to the purposes of God. Would you agree? Yes. So I can feel like, uh, like these, yeah, like the wave spins around my legs. When I feel that, I know there is a peregrine spirit mm. present, which means that that's an invitation. Yeah. That's an invitation for you to get in that boat. That's an invitation for you to say, Jesus, Jesus. 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 Whatever. 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 Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> I'm not responsible for your... Um, but it is an invitation. You see, because we haven't yet, yet conceived what this move of the Spirit is going to look like. Mm -hmm. But I promise you, God is going to invade the atmosphere. Amen. Yes. He's going to invade the atmosphere around you as you believe, because all released through your faith, as you're believing, um, the Prince of God can manifest around you. People start to do all kinds of strange things around you sometimes. They do me. Say weird things. You see, but they're like openings and open doors. But the thing is that the presence of God... Look, people out there have heard enough words. There is tired of hearing words. Quite honestly, I'm tired of sitting in church hearing more words. I want to hear more words. I want the Prince of God to come and do something. Amen. Oh, that's just going to take, isn't it? We're all believing for a fantastic move. It's prophesied, prophesied, prophesied. We've got an America. Well, how's that going to happen? It's going to happen when you love it and you want it and you want God to show up and you don't care what he does. Amen. Somebody asked me, my husband, to pray for them a while ago. Would you pray for me uh, to get in touch with God, but I don't want to speak in tongues and I don't want to fall over. <laughs> I don't want to laugh and I don't want to sort of go and say, no, I'm not going to pray for you. Nothing, God can't do anything for you. I can't tell you anything more off. <coughs> the guy came back the next day and said, okay. I'll <laughs> <laughs> get fire and water and tongues. <laughs> and I don't care if I fall over. So you have to come up like, I don't care. Because mm -hmm. some of the things God does when he moves, it's probably nothing like you've ever seen Amen. before. Amen. I mean, the room when, uh, you know, you put on the young people, and they were, they were in a circle praising the Lord, and they were all um, um, frozen. They were all frozen in the spirit for a long time. And this young boy just got saved. He's, like, he's 12 years old, in the middle of the circle, kneeling on the floor with his arm like this. And his arm and hand started to go around the room. Wow. And as it got opposite someone, they just hit the deck. Started getting delivered. Then we passed to the next person. But you see, the young people were scared and screaming, but their feet were stuck to the floor. <laughs> they were not able to move. So they got everybody, they were on the floor. Getting to live and set free. Then it moved on into the house where we were staying next door. And it sounded like a train. It was very scary. So like a huge train coming into the house. I saw people trying to put down their cups of tea and their coffee. And their little nightcaps trying to put down before it got to them. Because the whole house started to shake. And then next minute, bam! Everybody's on the floor. Getting set free and dealing with that after a little while it calms down. And suddenly all the children who were asleep, the Holy Spirit went up there and woke them all up. They all came down the stairs screaming and crying and repenting to their parents. I lied to you, Mom. I took money out of your purse, Mom. I lied to you, Mom. I lied to every day. You see, God did this whole uh, recon reconciliation thing in this church that they've been having lessons on for like six months. He did it in ten minutes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you 
Is that what we want now? Yes. All you have to do is keep your eyes up, keep believing. That's our inheritance. Isn't the presence of Jesus our inheritance? Yes. Isn't it? Yes. Isn't that what we're supposed to have? Because everything happens in the presence of the Lord. Yes. Do you ever go to Catherine Coleman meetings, anybody? Yeah. No way. Yeah. Wasn't it amazing, like, yeah. when she walked onto the platform, the whole auditorium was swimming in oil. The presence of the Lord. She didn't actually do anything, just talked a little bit. He was like getting healed all over the place. Because the presence mm-hmm. is presence. See, that's what's going to happen. He's uh, inviting us right now. He invited you to that boat this morning, the Peregrini. Inviting you to that. Um, but he's inviting us to let him take over. He's not going to attend our services. Yeah. That's going to be over soon. <laughs> so the only ones still standing will be the ones that don't care what he does. Pastor Karen could care less. He don't care what he does. As long as he does something. As long as he's got. You see, you can't tell him what to do. He's not asking your opinion. He's not asking your opinion. He's not asking your permission. He's just going to show up where he's welcome. Let me ask you something. Um, Because, you know, God does, does do some unusual things that your mind probably has never conceived. Um, unless you've seen those kind of things. But I'm just telling you now, some of it's very strange. It's the, the Bible says God does strange acts. And some of the things he does, I'm telling you, are strange. The mind does not understand. But you see, but if you open, you know the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter if you know him. Because you go by the witness in your spirit, don't you? You might see something, you've never seen that before, what's that? what's that? But you have to learn to listen to the witness in your spirit. Your spirit said, okay. Sometimes you understand later. Sometimes you do never get to understand. But I saw, I saw little kids that misbehaved in the meeting. I saw them stuck to the wall like that. <laughs> You know, like one of those circles that would be glued. Couldn't move for like seven hours. You couldn't unstick them. You couldn't pull them off. I I, I said, David, who was speaking, these two little kids at the end were like pushing each other, you know, who they do. Well, suddenly, David tells them to sit down, they couldn't sit down. Because both of them had one foot now to the floor. They could only do this. <laughs> so they said, Mr. David, pray for us. He said, no. <laughs> Thank you. You have to stay there. And I think they stayed there for about an hour. So, uh, you know, they were painted or whatever. And I saw them. This, they brought this new boy to David. He's about six. And he's going, ah. So David said, what's wrong with him? They said, he can't speak. So David said, has well, he always been like that? They said, no, when you were preaching, he was talking all the time. <laughs> <laughs> they said, well, God will give you your voice back when you repent, you know. And he walked up left him. You see, so <laughs> God is much more deals with us much more intimately. You know, I saw, I've seen a lot of things like that. So nothing surprises me much anymore. I'm open. Um, I saw, I saw this one time. I wish, 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 wish I had some, you know, my iPhone. Something. But we were in this whole room full of people. There's probably 50 people there doing this speaking. A sunny anointing fell. And all the people in this room were absolutely frozen for about three and a half hours. Now they all sat there. And when they did come back, they had no idea that they'd been gone three and a half hours. 
They went to different places, they went to heaven. And I will never forget, in the back in the corner was this one little old lady, she was knitting. And she, her needle stayed in this stitch for three and a half hours. When that anointing lived, she just came out. <laughs> you see, so God wants to do it himself. And he does use us, and yes, and we learn to yield. But he works in you, both to will and to do. Yeah. All the time we don't realise sometimes. But he just wants you to let him be willing to let him take over. Yeah. Let him do what he wants to do. Otherwise you're going to end up with a religious thing, aren't we? And if we resist him, they'll get more religious. I'll end up telling you this one. This is a bit strange, but it happened. Do you know who Arthur Burt is? Some of you think okay, Arthur Burt. He was in the ministry for like, he was 90 years. She died at 102, he's in the ministry since he was eight. So when I was in a church in Gainesville, Florida, Arthur Burt came by and he spoke on Wednesday night in the meeting. And he told the story about a revival he was in. He said in this revival in the north of England, they had a big meeting in the marketplace and the noise kept falling on the children. So the children would fall on the floor and they'd be flapping all over the floor. The God was just doing things. We well, see that happened a few weeks, then the leaders said, you, this is interrupting our meeting. So they told the parents to put the children on their lap and hang on to them. And when the anointing would just hold on to them, don't let them fall on the floor. But the anointing fell, the kids fell off the laps onto the floor and they're flapping all over the floor. You see, because God was doing something. But then the this is interfering with our meeting, so the, the leaders said, take the children out and put them in the basement while we have our meeting. So they took the children out, put them in the basement. Every week now, they had their meeting, they put the children in the basement. Now the basement's cold, but the children came up. There's steam coming off the walls. The children are absolutely drunk in the spirits. They're carrying them home, dropping around, you know, and having visitations from God and everything. But of course, guess what, eventually, God just, didn't he just stop coming? Because he was trying to move on everybody. He just started with the children, but it interfered with their stuff, their service. So Arthur tells this story in this church in Gainesville on Wednesday nights. Okay? The next Wednesday, the very next Wednesday, in that meeting, the same meeting, the Holy Spirit fell on the children. Children all fell on the floor. And do you know what they did? They told the men to take the children outside and put them on the grass outside the church. So the children are outside now on the grass outside the church having visitations from God. Going in chariots, talking to the angels, dancing with the angels, so that the big people could have their meeting. You see, you think that's not possible, but people wouldn't actually do what he just talked about a week ago. And she said, God's given us plenty of heads up. What do you want? Please tell me what do you want. Wouldn't like to do a religious service or something. It ain't going to be happening. It's not going to be happening, go to the road where they just want us to go through hymns. Because you can't tell what he's going to do. He's going to do it though. I promise you, it's already happening. So I'm available. I'm available. Don't say if you're not. So I'm yielding to the Holy Spirit. I'm yielding to the Holy Spirit. I'm not telling God what to do. I'm not telling God what to do. He can do anything. He can do anything. Whatever. 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 And so I'm getting in that peregrini boat. The peregrini boat. With no oars. With no rudder. When Brendan went one time in a peregrini boat, the winds took them to after several days to this island and the boat came up to the island and there was an old man on the shore and he said I've been waiting for you and he called them all by name and prophesied over them all and said I can go now pray for me so they blessed him he gave the spirit to God 
Sometimes, you know, when you're having your quiet time, your prayer time, or whatever you do, just be quiet. Be quiet. It's not really, I mean, you know, we've had this big extra fasting. We've been praying for three days and fasting and all that. Now it's the time to be quiet. Let God talk to you. Let God show you something that you maybe never realized before. There's a time to be quiet. I think this is a time to be quiet for a couple of weeks, you know. I'm not telling you not to pray if the Holy Spirit comes on you, but don't just suddenly start praying because that's what you do. <laughs> he works in you, both to will and to do. He works in you in all kinds of ways you don't even know. You just do things because that's what you feel like doing, but it's Him working in you. Last year I was in Indianapolis doing a conference. Friday night in the middle of the night I woke up and I had to have this milk. I was going crazy to get some milk. I'm not a milk drinker, I don't drink milk. I just got to get some milk. Well I got up and in my little sweet thing I looked at the fridge and a gallon of milk. I went, oh, you would put a gallon of milk in my fridge? Well I drank half of it. Don't stop drinking milk. What's wrong with you? Anyway, I, but when I got up in the morning, I told them, I said, God, I just have to have this milk, and I drank all this milk, a half a gallon of milk. They said, oh, that means we're going to win. I said, we've been praying, we're going to win. It was the Indy 500. Well, guess what they do when they win? They drink milk. And they throw milk over each other. And they won. And they threw milk everywhere. See, God was showing me prophetically. It's true. I don't even like milk. You see, so if you're well in the he moves on you, and you have to, I didn't even know what it was. I'd never had an Indy 500, you know. I don't know what that is. Is it most bikes or something? What is it? Cars. Oh, cars. <laughs> you see, so naturally, when you use God, you enjoy God. Don't be heavy and religious. He works in you all the time. You know, because one thing he puts his desires in your heart, doesn't he? He puts his desires in your heart, so when you serve him, it's delightful. Yeah. It's not hard. I'm not saying there aren't any bumps in the road. But you know, basically it's delightful because it's in your heart. It's a heart thing, the new covenant. It's delightful. Uh, you know, be my people, I've got my, a new heart and a new spirit within you. And they'll be my sons and daughters. We're not in the old covenant, we're in the new covenant. It's a hard thing in the new covenant, isn't it? We're in us. So, uh, let me do this. Get, move out of your seat for a minute. Because I can still feel those, um, the way things around me. And there is, you know, God does fun things, but 